Ever since Python 3.5 was released, we've had a really powerful way to write IO-bound async code using the async and await keywords. On this episode, you'll meet Nathaniel Smith, who wrote the TRIO async framework that significantly simplifies complex coordinating operations using async and await. This is Talk Python to Me, episode 167, recorded June 21st, 2018. Welcome to Talk Python to Me, a weekly podcast on Python, the language, the libraries, the ecosystem, and the personalities. This is your host, Michael Kennedy. Follow me on Twitter where I'm at mkennedy. Keep up with the show and listen to past episodes at talkpython.fm and follow the show on Twitter via at talkpython. This episode is sponsored by Linode and Rollbar. Please check out what they're offering during their segments. It really helps support the show. Nathaniel, welcome to Talk Python. Hey, thanks for having me. It's great to have you here. I've wanted to have you on for a long time. I, you know, listeners of the yeah. show are probably fan know that I'm a fan of async programming and parallel programming. <laughs> That's definitely gotten some feedback and some attention, but I, I think it's super important for Python. And I think what you're doing is incredible. Some of the stuff you showed at PyCon this year was incredible. So I'm, just, I'm really Thank excited you. to talk about it. Yeah, it's going to be fun. Before we get to that, though, let's get your story. Okay into programming in Python. So let's see. So for, yeah, getting into programming, I mean, I guess I was, you know, fortunate in my choice of parents. I was sort of, you know, born into sort of a relatively affluent family. And my mother was also a professional programmer, though she mostly um, stopped, you know, switched to sort of part-time consulting when the kids came along so she could be a stay-at-home mom. So actually, I first learned to program through, in my elementary school, they did the, have this program, this teaching logo to us that my mom created this project at my elementary school. <laughs> wow. That's pretty awesome. Most, <laughs> yeah. Many, many moms so, uh, volunteer at schools, but not any of them create the right. learning yeah. programs. For the yeah. School. No, you yeah, know, my mom is pretty incredible. She also loves podcasts. So, I mean, I guess, Hey, <laughs> hi mom. <laughs> uh, maybe she'll listen to this. Yeah, I mean, she later uh, went on to get a master's in education and is now teaches uh, art and science and programming and things. Yeah, but so yeah, so I got started early and was fortunate enough to have my own computer starting around like age 10 and so on. So this was like in the days when I was like, it was DOS, Windows 3.1 was pretty exciting. Like 386, 46 type thing. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, turbo button to like make it go oh, yeah, faster. Yeah, turbo button. Yeah. yeah, we don't have turbo buttons anymore. No, it just always goes fast. Isn't that weird, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Isn't there a little button to make her laptop <laughs> half, the, half the speed? Like, why wouldn't everyone want that? Yeah. So, and then I, from there, I, was, I installed Linux when I was like 13 on my computer, messing around. I had no idea what I was doing. It was Slackware 96 because like was the name of it because it was, it's like, you know, Windows 95 was the big thing then. So like this was one better, right? 96. Well, sure. Um, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, right. So yeah, so I've kind of been, you know, bumming around that kind of, you know, programming open source world for something years now. It took me a little longer to get into Python. I don't remember exactly when it probably, you know, five years later. Or so I remember the first time people were talking about, you know, Python was this cool new thing. It's, you know, kind of like Perl, but so forth. Uh, first time I read the tutorial, I got to the point where it said that Lambda was syntactically limited to a single expression and just like rage quit. I was like, whatever, what stupid language. <laughs> where are the uh, curly braces? Come on. Yeah, well, it wasn't, I mean, I guess also like, so like, but I had like sort of like logo, I learned scheme and things like that. So yeah. like, this was like, obviously terrible. I later came back to it, got over that. And I and under, you know, understand now why that makes sense in terms of the, the block structure and everything. But the statement expression distinction that Python has, but uh, it took me a little while. But yeah, so I, yeah, I guess I got into Python around like 2.2 or so, and sort of gradually become you know just sort of my main language. I, in the meantime, I was also like you know, I was getting a PhD uh, stuff like that, so using Python for both like hobby hacking stuff, and also like for my in my work you know for data analysis, uh, I wrote some various libraries there. Got and. What's your PhD in? Yeah, cognitive science. Oh, right. Okay. Very awesome. Yeah. yeah. So it's like studying how people understand language and brains understand language. Yeah. So, yeah. So along the way, and then, yeah, getting embedded in all these different sort of, you know, entangled in all these different sort of open source projects, like NumPy and, and so on. Yeah. So, yeah. That's really great. So what do you do these days? 
So I'm actually kind of in uh, a bit of transition right now. So the last few years, I've been uh, working at UC Berkeley at the Berkeley Institute for Data Science, which is a sort of new data science center that was started up on campus. And so in my position has been sort of this unique uh, one, really, where it's uh, been, I've been grant funded to sort of figure out how to, you know, make sure the Python, you know, continues to work well, works better for scientists. There's a, actually, there's a blog post we can like put a link to there. I, I wrote just sort of talking about all the sort of stuff I've done there, but some highlights being like, I got um, some grants for uh, NumPy development, uh, $1.3 million over a few years, um, which wow. is basically the first time NumPy has been funded. We'll have full-time people working on it. Did I made a color map people like and did some work on Python packaging. So like uh, many Linux sort of led that effort mm-hmm. so we can have wheels on Linux now. Oh, that um, sounds like a really fun job. Like you get to actually yeah. make a, a difference in the open source space. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, partly it's, it's sort of funny. Like this is what I talk about in the blog post, but like, you know, open source is just sort of like desperately underfunded and like, it's amazing how well and effectively we can use the little bits of volunteer time and things that people manage or, you know, people with spending, you know, a few hours a week, but there's a lot of things that like larger projects that have huge impact that can't be done in that mode where you actually need to like sit down for a little while and think about it and you know, understand the landscape and put some focused effort into something. Yeah. Um, there's a difference on like what you yeah. take as your goal. If you have a month of uninterrupted full time effort right. on some project or a goal part of a project versus I'm going to squeeze this in Saturday morning before the kids get up. Right. Th- these exactly. are not the same types of things you attack. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, like a month of time is not that much in the grand scheme of things. One person, one month is like compared to, you know, the amount of labor that, like, you know, Google has available. <laughs> yeah. But it still, you know, enables all kinds of things that right now just aren't happening. And so there's actually lots of low hanging fruit because no, there is nobody almost who has that kind of time to worry about these sort of broad open source ecosystem kind of projects. So there was just, there's yeah, all we kinds saw, of- We saw how much of a difference uh, was made with the Mozilla grant the Python packaging. Or IPI, yes. Yeah, yeah no, that IPI, was like that was like, hey, look, $170,000. Oh, actually, this can happen. It's been dragging on for years. Now it's, you know, it's real. Yeah. yeah, I mean, getting the team together to make that happen was, yeah, I, I had a little bit of involvement. I'm, I'm on the PSF's packaging working group. Nice. I, didn't, I wasn't heavily involved in that. You know, I like made some introductions, gave some feedback on the grant and things. So it was, yeah, it's been really super great. exciting to see that you know, up close. Because, yeah, it was very successful. And it was yeah, I feel like it really got a lot out of how much investment was put into it. Yeah. I mean, it was like that had been dragging on for literally six years. The old PyPI was just totally unworkable. <laughs> but, you know. <laughs> it was like Krypton for uh, people who wanted to contribute to open source. They looked at it and like, oh, no, no, I'm not touching that. That's yeah, not- I, I, made, I made one patch to the old PyPI. And it was just a trivial thing. It was just that we wanted it to start say that, oh yeah, many Linux is now a legal thing for a wheel to have in its name. So it's just like, there's like a list of strings that are allowed. I'm not like just adding one new string, right? Um, that was the most terrifying patch I've ever made, PR I've ever made. Because it's like, if I have a typo, then PyPI dies, right? And there are no tests. There's nothing, right? The consequences like, failure. Five without so a net. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah, the new the new PyPI is way way better. You should all go and you know help make it contribute because now they've like it's like all set up. You can develop locally, and there's a real test suite and all. Yeah, it's really nice. I, I had the people involved on the show a couple episodes back too, so definitely got a chance to dig into that. Oh yeah, that's right. Good. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about async because yeah. I think that that's one of the sort of revitalized areas of Python last. Mm-hmm. For you sure, know, since yeah. three four three five, it really started coming along, right? So what in three four we got async IO as a, a thing, and in uh, three yeah. five it really I feel like it really got more accessible with async and await, right? With the new syntax features to make it easier to use, exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like the keep it, the foundation was built previously, but it was mm-hmm. it was still this sort of callback hell type of programming, right? Right. right. <laughs> We should maybe take a little bit of a step back and just, you know, let people know about the presentation you gave at PyCon, which introduces sure. your project Trio, which is what we're going to focus on. But in your talk, you sort of set the stage and said, look, there's these two philosophies or types of async programming 
that you might consider. So maybe maybe you could touch on that uh, a little. Well, so I mean, I think the first thing to say is for those who aren't kind of already you know up on the jargon, async is sort of a subset of concurrent programming, and so concurrency meaning writing programs that do two things at the same time, which is very handy. Um, you know, it's something in our real life we do all the time. You know. You, you know, I'm working on one thing and my friend's working on another thing at the same time. It's very yeah. natural. But writing a program that does that is a little bit trickier, especially, you know, and Python is kind of generally a sequential language, right? It's, it makes it easy to do, I want to do this and then that and then the other thing. Uh, but it doesn't directly have built into like the syntax, whatever ways to say, I want to do these two things at the same time. And then when they're both done, uh, do these other things. So, so generally, there's this general question of like, how do you write concurrent programs in Python? And then I think what you were thinking of, there's kind of two philosophies of concurrency, which is one is the kind of preemptive concurrency that threads give you, where just everything just kind of runs all the time, interleaved kind of in arbitrary ways. To be clear, this is yeah. in general threads, not Python threads, because we have this whole thing called the guild. Uh, from the programmer, from the user's point of view, the guild doesn't make, guild makes things slower, but it doesn't make it really change what it feels like to use it compared to threads in general. True. So in general, in threads, you might have like two threads actually running at the same time, like on two different CPUs. Because of Python, we have the global interpreter lock, the gil, then it means that mostly only one thread can actually run at a time. But because in Python interpreter controls that, and it can decide at any moment to switch which thread is running, from your point of view is writing code in Python, it might as well be running multiple things at the same time, basically, right? Because since it could switch at any moment, you kind of have to act like it's just constantly switching, right? And the reason this is kind of a challenge is because if you have a data structure and you have two different threads or whatever, you know, you two different concurrent pieces of code acting on the data structure at the same time, if they're not, like, if you're not careful, you can make a big mess. So, like, you know, one... You know, the classic examples are things like, you know, uh, your uh, program is like managing like a bank. And so I'm going to withdraw money from this account and then add it to this, put it in this account. But if you don't do that, like atomically, so like I, you know, first one, one thread says, okay, does Alice have enough money? Yeah, great. Okay, I'll take that money out and put it into Bob's account. Another thread says, oh, does Alice have enough money for this transfer to Carl? And then if they're in a leave right, first both threads check and say, oh, yeah, Alice has plenty of money. And then both threads take money out of the account. And now Alice has spent the same money twice, actually, which yeah, is exactly. great for Alice, but not so nice for the bank. Right? <laughs> so, yeah, uh, someone's going to be in trouble running, writing that software. That's exactly. Right. Yeah, right. So, yeah, if, you, if you're writing that software, you need to sort of manage this. Yeah. So one and of the this, things that kind of helped me this like click in my mind was thinking about how programs temporarily enter these invalid states. Right, this, exactly. What you're describing is basically that like at the beginning of that function, the bank is in a valid state. At the mm -hmm. end of the function, everything is valid, but somewhere in between, in order to accomplish that operation as a series of steps, it has to become right. invalid. And long as nobody observes it in this invalid state, it's all good. But when they do, right. like, like, like you're describing, halfway through, it's not okay anymore. It's kind of like transactions and databases, but exactly. yeah. in time, and yeah, yeah, they're pretty similar in some ways, I guess. Yeah. So yeah, exactly. So with threads, what you, the solution to this is you have to sort of explicitly like make sure you notice all those places where you're passing through that invalid state and do some kind of, and like mark it somehow in your source code. Like say, okay, I'm going to take a lock here that's going to make sure that anyone else who tries to use this has to wait for me to be done and things get back to the valid state before they can look at it, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. But that's really error pro. Right? And this because, is preemptive concurrency, right? Yeah, exactly. It's still talking okay. about kind of how threads work, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. So you have to like find all these places where you go through a temporarily invalid state and mark them in your source code. And if you forget one, then you have this nasty bug <laughs> where Alice gets to spend the money twice or all kinds of weird things can happen. And it usually has to do with uh, timing. And so it's very it's super hard to debug. Yeah. It's really and it's like, yeah, it's like super subtle. Like, yeah, like it only happens one in a thousand times randomly. And it happens, depends on how much memory you have. And it only happens in production and not on your tests. And just all kinds of, it's really, yep. really most bugs. Yeah. It's bad. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard them described as Heisenbugs. And I just love that term. <laughs> yes. Yes. Heisenbugs. Right. <laughs> and it's just, like, and so it means that when you're working with threads, you just have to be like constantly vigilant, right? Like every line of code, if you think, okay, is this the one? that's going to introduce this terrible bug. So that's, that sucks, right? You don't want to have to live like that. So like be paranoid. <laughs> yeah, right? You just have to be like constantly paranoid. So yeah, so the idea for async concurrency is we kind of 
flip it around. Instead of make, saying that like, okay, we have to go through and find all the places in the source code where something dangerous is happening and mark those, we say, you know what, let's be conservative. Let's assume something dangerous could be happening anywhere. That's the default. So by default, only one thing is allowed to happen at a time. And then we'll mark in the source code, you know, okay, here's a place where I want to let other things happen. It's okay for, I'm not in the middle of, you know, just doing some delicate operation, you know, adjusting someone's bank account. This is a fine place for that to happen. This portion of Talk Python to Me is brought to you by Linode. Are you looking for bulletproof hosting that's fast, simple, and incredibly affordable? Look past that bookstore and check out Linode at talkpython.fm slash Linode. That's L-I-N-O-D-E. Plans start at just $5 a month for a dedicated server with a gig of RAM. They have 10 data centers across the globe, so no matter where you are, there's a data center near you. Whether you want to run your Python web app, host a private Git server or file server, you'll get native SSDs on all the machines, a newly upgraded 200 gigabit network, 24-7 friendly support, even on holidays, and a seven-day money-back guarantee. Do you need a little help with your infrastructure? They even offer professional services to help you get started with architecture, migrations, and more. Get a dedicated server for free for the next four months. Just visit talkpython.fm slash Linode. And you can still have bugs. You can still, you can still make mistakes and put that in the wrong place. But it's just much, because now there's only like a finite number of places to check when that gets, something goes wrong, right? It's just much easier to reason about that kind of program. Right. And that could be done with just straight up async IO, but with 3.5 and above, like basically the await keyword is the marker in your code for that. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's yeah. pretty beautiful. That's pretty beautiful. So I'm guess I'm guess most people will probably under, understand like how to use async and await the keywords, but maybe just describe like what how to define like a super, super simple async method with the keyword just so that people understand this. Yeah, thing. like you said, I'm going to be uh, focusing on Trio here. And Trio does kind of use only kind of a, a simple subset. There's some extra complexity needed for like backwards compatibility with async IO sort of callback based thing. We can get talk about that more later. Uh, but sort of for, if, if, especially if you're just, you know, if you're using Trio, um, a stink await is very simple actually. And so here's what you need to know is that there are two kinds of functions. There's the async ones, uh, which are these the special functions that might let other code run during them. And so you kind of need to be aware when you call one of them that like, you know, the ground might shift under your feet, data structures might change while it's happening. And there's the regular functions, like the synchronous functions, where those always happen atomically. And so, and what we're going to do is we're going to make all the regular Python functions you already know, those are going to be the synchronous ones. Because, you know, no one, you know, they're all written on the assumption that like, you know, Python's a sequential language, it does things sequentially. And so they, no one like thought about how to handle this async stuff when they were writing all these libraries that already exist. So those are going to be all atomic. Um, and then we need a way to mark these special async functions. And we want to mark it at two places. So what we want to mark it when we define the function so that we, you know, as part of the API, is this an async function or not? And we want to mark it at the call sites. So when you call one of these, when you're like reading through your code, you see, aha, this is a point where I'm calling an async function. This is a point where other code might run in the background. I need to make sure I'm not in the middle of some, you know, dangerous operation, right? Right, okay, so you've got like so, maybe a call to a, a web service or something. And yeah, yeah. that might return like a future, which then you uh, hook in a so call by. There, are, there are no futures in Trio. <laughs> that was one of the things I got rid of. <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's beautiful, but, yeah. But um, you, gotta, you have to await on the result basically, right? So yeah, Convert I mean, so yeah, so the way, yeah, the way you think about it for Trio is just that, it's just like there are these special functions and the way you call it is you type await and then the function call. It's like a new kind of syntax for calling a function. Um, right. And that's sort of all you need to know. There is, yeah, like you said, like there's the complexities around Python also supports awaiting on objects and having future objects that the function can return and so on and so forth. But it's kind of unnecessary clutter is kind of how Trio's perspective on it. So we just don't do any of that. Yeah, I feel like the async IO layer is like, let's get something kind of working. <laughs> but it's not that delightful. And I feel like Trio really cleans it up. So there's a really great example that you gave in your talk about happy eyeballs, which is like a way sure. to try to use uh, basically DNS resolution to connect to a socket to a server uh, and, mm -hmm. and some concurrency stuff around that, which is, I don't want to talk about that yet. Maybe we'll, we'll have some time to talk about it later. But basically, there's a, a version in Twisted, which is, how, how long was the one in Twisted? Hundreds and um, lines? 
So yeah, well, yeah, there's two different versions of Twisted I talk about in the talk. One is the sort of the classic one that's in, in Master, which is like 120 lines long, I think, roughly. I mean, not the, it's not super meaningful to talk about lines of code like this, but like just kind of give you a sense, yeah. Yeah, um, exactly. A better a sense of complicated is to reason about that is it has, inside this method, it has another internal function. Inside that function, there's another function defined. And then inside that, there's a fourth level of internal functions. So like... <laughs> So yeah, that's bad. Because <laughs> it's all these. Yeah, yeah. It's almost like it's full of all these go tos in, in some weird sense. And then at the end, you basically say, now if we apply the building blocks or the primitives of Trio to it, oh, look, it's like 20 lines and it's totally straightforward, which is, is really great. So I think, you know, let's talk about Trio. Mm-hmm. So why don't you just start by telling people what it is? Trio is a library uh, for async concurrency in Python. It's like an alternative to libraries like async AO or Twisted or so on, which NATO is, or Threads, <laughs> it's sort of all of them. And I think there's kind of, I think it was, there's kind of two pieces. So one is there's sort of the idea trio, the ideas are like a research project or something, where I have, I sort of did some analysis of like, what is it about Twisted and async IO and so on that makes it so difficult to use sometimes? Or why are things like happy eyeballs so complicated? What are some common errors sort of come from. It came up with like, oh, that's actually, I sort of, as I dug into it, I realized actually there's, you know, a small number of things that kind of seem to cause a lot of the problems and even ended up digging into some old literature from like the 60s about early programming language design. On Univac or what was that one on? That was like a really old computer. Oh, oh Flowmatic. The, Flowmatic, uh, yeah. That language, which is, yeah, the Grace Hopper's language, the precursor to COBOL. Which is a really that's, interesting that, That's going way back, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And sort of talking about this transition, there was a lot of debates then about like, how do you structure your language? Not even getting into the concurrency part, just like how do you do a language at all that's like usable? And one of the big things that happened was this switch from using GoTo as the main control structure to having things like if statements and functions and for loops and so on. And I realized there's actually sort of an analogy there that's surprisingly like precise between a lot of that a lot of these async libraries are actually still kind of in the go-to stage where sort of the basic primitives are in sort of a technical way kind of analogous to a go-to and they cause similar kinds of problems and then if you look at okay how did you know Dijkstra solve these problems back in the late 60s we can take those and apply them to concurrency and that leads to something called I call the nursery concept. Yeah, it's so interesting. And I had, yeah, and I had never thought about the relationship between GoTo and many of these programming, these threaded programming models. But you really hit it well. I think it's a super good analogy and it's really relevant. Because so what Dijkstra said was look, you should be able to treat these building blocks as black boxes. Stuff goes in, stuff goes out. That's all. If you know kind of what it does, you don't need the details, right? I mean, this is like a huge yeah. sort of abstraction and programming, like functions, yeah. classes, it's modules, et cetera, right? Yeah. Like, yeah, I mean, I have like even just think of like, outputs. like in Python, think of the print function, right? Like, and actually, it does all kinds of complicated stuff, right? It's got talking to the operating system interfaces to do I.O. And it's like buffering and character second version and blah, blah, blah. But like, you don't have to care about that, right? You just type print hello world and it, you know, in Prince of the World. You exactly. can just treat that as like this little atomic unit. And right. that's, that's great. A, that kind of, yeah, it's know, such that, an important yeah. part of a building block of programming. But these threads mean that stuff can still be going. You're just like all over the place, right? And it's very similar to the go-tos, which I thought that was a great analogy. Yeah, I mean, specifically the issue is, so like let's say the, the analog of print, like in say Twisted, you have this transport object that's like your connection, like a network connection, and you call its write method. And this says like, I want to send this data to the remote site. Now, and that's like a function, you call it, it returns, that's all fine. But what's sort of confusing is that when you call it, it returns, it hasn't actually finished yet. What it's actually done is sort of scheduled that write to happen in the background. And that makes it hard to reason about the flow because it's like, oh, the function's returned, but actually in a sense, it's like kind of still running, right? You know, if I want to write and then do something else that happens after that, that's hard to manage because I don't necessarily know when that's actually finished. I have to use some other API to like check and ask, okay, has it actually written yet? Yeah. And so, yeah. Did it succeed? Did it not succeed? Then how do you deal with that? And then how do you get that back into your, yeah, your whole flow? It's, it's, it feels like almost like JavaScript. (laughs) Well, I mean, JavaScript, you know, is also in this general family of like, yeah, it is, it has this async currency model 
that's sort of endemic to it we use all over the place and it's all callback based and it's all yeah it has that same kind of go-to problem yeah exactly so yeah. let's talk about the architecture and then maybe like yeah we can see about how that kind of brings us back into something that Daisha might be proud of. Okay, sure. Yeah. Um, I guess I should also mention, so I don't know how, like this is a discussion that really benefits from like diagrams, which is not something podcasts are great at. <laughs> so there is also, I have a blog post called uh, notes on structure concurrency or go statement considered harmful, which goes into this and sort of these set of ideas in much more detail pictures and all that. But so, yeah, so the, basically the idea is that, I mean, so it's what I said, right? That like, when you call a function, it should be something you can treat as a black box. It does some stuff, it returns. That's kind of what's Dijkstra's point. I mean, that's the problem with GoTo is also that like, in the old GoTo world, you could call a function and maybe it returns, maybe it jumps somewhere else, maybe some other function and some other point of your code suddenly returns instead because the control, GoTo just lets, you know, functions have the certain control flow they're supposed to have, right? Where you have your function and then you call something. So control jumps into that function. It executes that code and then it comes back again to your function. That's kind of this nice little structure. That's why it's, you could treat it as a black box because you know, oh, it'll do some stuff, but then it'll come back. Right. Go to it isn't like that. It's just, it's just a one way you leap off somewhere else and then maybe you come back. You could jump back. It's something you do manually. <laughs> Um, and then like a, choose your own adventure book. You don't know when you're yeah. done. You don't know where to begin. Or you just like, it's always a mess. It's always a surprise. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's choose your own adventure, except that then you're like, you know, actually I want to switch. I'm going to, it says I can go to page five or 10, but I'm going to 17. <laughs> Let's see what happens. Right? So yeah. So in that, and that breaks this function abstraction, right? So it means like you call a function and, you know, hopefully like if it's like a nice, well-written library and people aren't like messing with you, it will come back normally. But there's no kind of guarantee of that in the language. Like if someone decided to be clever, they could, it could do something else. It could jump somewhere else. I mean, it becomes very hard to sort of reason about the overall structure of your program, if that's true. And it also breaks sort of higher level structures that people are using the program. Like, so, so think about exceptions, right? So it's very, a handy thing about exceptions is like, oh, if something goes wrong, then, you know, and I didn't think about how to deal with it locally, then the exception will propagate out in Python. And so until either someone catches it and knows how to deal with it or the program crashes, you get a trace back. And like, that's not great, but at least, you know, you didn't just like go blindly on doing the wrong thing. At least, you know, you get a trace back. You can try and figure out what's going, what happened, right? But not with, not with threading. <laughs> not if you can. Well, okay, we'll, we'll get there in a moment, right? I was saying, but <laughs> if, if, in the, if you have GoTo, then it's where do you, when you raise an exception, it goes up the stack, right? It's like, Okay, does this function want to handle it? Okay, how about its caller? How about its caller's caller? Right, because you have this nice stack kind of idea. You, you know, you know who the caller is. You know who the caller's caller is. If you have go to, then control just bounces around sort of at random. So who wants to know about this exception? Like I don't have a well-defined sense of a caller even. Right, it's just like these basic things we take for granted growing up, and you know, this, you know, our ancestors struggled with and sort of fixed for us, and now we take for granted. Right, but like these basic assumptions just aren't there in the language of go to. Yeah. With blocks yeah. have similar issues, right? So like a with block is supposed to like, you say with open file, and then you know, okay, inside the block, the file's open, outside the block, the file is closed. That's nice. It's great. It makes it easy to manage resources. But if you have go to, you like, you jump into the middle of a block, you jump out of the middle of the block, like what happens? Is the, where does the file open and close? Like, it, how does that even, I don't even, <laughs> it just, it just doesn't work, right? Exactly. So, yeah. So yeah. And then, and then if you look at like problems we're dealing with threads or, things that are a struggle in like a sync IO or twisted, but these are kind of the things that are problematic, right? So you call a function, is it, you know, it's still running maybe when it returns, it makes it hard to like control sequencing, hard to treat things as black boxes. Um, like you don't know, like you need to like go read the source code when you use some random async IO based library to find out like, okay, I called this function, but did it actually do the thing then? Or is it scheduled something in the background? Like you have yeah. to go. You does know, the error there. go to the caller or does it go to the callback? Does it go to and then, call? and right. Yeah. So if you spawn off this background thread or background task, as async IO calls it, and it crashes, or there's an error, there's an unhandled exception to do with that. Well, you've lost, you don't have a nice sort of call stack that you've, you've spun up this new independent entity that's executing and it's now split apart from your original code. And so there's sort of like, where does that, if there's an unhandled error, an exception, then what, what actually happens is that in threads and async IO and twist or whatever, is it, you know, maybe prints something on standard, like, Hey, uh, I hope someone's looking, something went wrong. And then it throws away the exception and carries on. 
and you know, it hopefully, does make your software more reliable because there's way fewer crashes when you don't actually. Well, <laughs> for some value of reliable, right? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> nice. Okay, so what are the yeah. building blocks of Trio that like yeah, sort of address exactly. these problems? Yeah. Yeah. So the main thing that is in Trio, we have this thing we call a nursery, and the idea it's just a, sort of a silly joke, right? About if you want to spawn a child task then it's not okay for it just to be go off independently. Like it has, you have to like put it somewhere and it'll be like taken care of. It's like a nursery is where children live. And, okay. <laughs> so concretely what is, is if you want to spawn a child task in Trio, you have to first have a nursery object. The way you get a nursery object is you write async with trio.open nursery as nursery. So it's like this open, you have like a with block that opens a nursery and then you get this nursery object. And the object is tied to that with block. And so, and then once you have that, you can say nursery, there's a method on that nursery to spawn a task into it. And all the tasks you spawn to the nursery will run concurrently. But then the, the trick is that that with block, its lifetime in the parent is tied to the lifetime of the child tasks. So that you can't exit the with block while there's still children running. If you hit the end of the with block, then the parent just stops and waits for them. So the stuff within the with block yeah. could be interwoven in like in certain ways, async and concurrent. But right. taken as a whole, the with block is like a black box. You start it, it runs, and then out comes the answer at the end, and everything's done, or it's gotten into its canceled state, or whatever happens to it, right? Exactly, exactly, yeah. And so, right, and that, so that lets us do things like, so right, so now if you call a function in Trio, you know, well, okay, it might internally open a nursery and have some currency, but by the time it finishes, it's done. It hasn't left anything running. Or if you have, a, if something crashes, we have some child task, you know, has an exception that is, you know, it doesn't catch. Then we say, okay, what do we do with this? Oh, well, wait, the parent is just sitting there waiting for the child. So the, what we do is the exception hops into the parent and continues executing. So, or, sorry, continues like propagating out. So Trio sort of follows the normal Python rule of, you know, you can catch an exception, but if you don't, then it will keep propagating until someone does. Right. So that nursery is a really important block a yeah. building block here. And I think, you know, it's it's really cool to be able to start all these child tasks and they can even be sort of children of the children, right? Like you could pass the nursery and the child task could spawn more child tasks and whatever. And so it's all going to sort of be done at the end. This portion of Talk Python to Me has been brought to you by Rollbar. One of the frustrating things about being a developer is dealing with errors, Ugh. relying on users to report errors, digging through log files, trying to debug issues, or getting millions of alerts just flooding your inbox and ruining your day. With Rollbar's full stack error monitoring, you get the context, insight, and control you need to find and fix bugs faster. Adding Rollbar to your Python app is as easy as pip install Rollbar. You can start tracking production errors and deployments in eight minutes or less. Are you considering self-hosting tools for security or compliance reasons? Then you should really check out Rollbar's compliant SaaS option. Get advanced security features and meet compliance without the hassle of self-hosting, including HIPAA, ISO 27001, Privacy Shield, and more. They'd love to give you a demo. Give Rollbar a try today. Go to talkpython.fm slash rollbar and check them out. The other thing that's really important in this type of threading is to not block forever, to not wait on something forever, right? So, oh yeah, so you're, yeah, right, you're talking about timeouts and cancel scopes. Timeouts and cancel scopes and all that stuff, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Yeah. so this is, yeah, this is a really basic problem. If you're doing anything kind of network programming, for example, or, you know, any kind of thing where your program's talking to other programs, other resources, because sometimes those will just, like, stop responding. So it's like, if you make an HTTP request, then maybe it'll succeed, Maybe it'll fail. You'll get like, you know, a 404 or something like that. Or but there's also a third possibility, which is that it just never finishes, right? Like the network disappeared and it just like sits there forever. And your program, totally bad. yeah. And like you kind of, I mean, if it's just writing a little script or whatever, it's like that you're running at the command line, it's fine. You know, you have some point you'll get bored and hit control C, it's fine. But for sort of more complicated systems, you need to be robust against this. Or unattended. Yeah. System yeah. like well, we have ten yeah. workers, but we're only getting this super low throughput. Why? Well, because eight of them are like just blocked forever. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you need to somehow you know detect this, be able to get out, and say okay, actually, let's stop doing that. <laughs> Try something else, raise an error, or something, but like you know, not just sit there forever. So that means yeah, there's just like, and this is just a problem that's just endemic, right? It's just every time you do any kind of networking or other kinds of IPC, 
you need to have this kind of timeout support. So that's one thing that makes it tricky. The other thing that makes timeouts tricky is that usually the place where you need to set the timeout is like buried way, way down deep inside the code. It's like at some point your HTTP client, you know, is using some socket library and the socket library is like trying to send some bytes or read some bytes from the network, like a very, very low level operation that's probably buried under like five levels of abstraction. But then where you want to set the timeout is like way out at the top where you say like, I just want to say if this HTTP request isn't done in 10 seconds, then give up. So timeouts are this problem that's like, you need them everywhere and you need coordination across different layers of your system. So it's this really complicated problem that like covers, you really kind of need your a timeout framework that's like used universally by everyone and kind of like coordinates, can coordinate across that system. And it can be super so, tricky. Like imagine you want to call like two web services and do a database transaction. And if one times out, you want them all to like, Roll yeah, back, right. Sure. Which is like yeah, super. Kind of, like, how do you coordinate that? Like, there's just incre- you know, like, yeah, almost impossible, right? Unless, yeah. unless you put it in trio. So yeah, so right, yeah. So the traditional way to do this is like you have a timeout framework sort of inside each library. Like, in, you know, your HTTP client has a timeout argument that you pass or whatever. But that doesn't help with people just don't do that reliably. And yeah, and it doesn't solve these coordination problems. So in Trio, we say like, no, this is something that we're just going to bake into the library, to the I/O library itself. So all libraries that work with Trio, if you have an HTTP client that in Trio, it uses Trio's timeout system. And so in this, this thing called cancel scope. So again, there's a lot more details on this in a blog post that I wrote called uh, Timeouts and Cancellation for Humans. We'll put the link in the podcast <laughs> description, I guess. But in basically, yeah, it's, it's fairly simple to use. Basically, the, the way it works is you can just anywhere in your code say, you know, with timeout 10 seconds, and then you put code inside that with block. And if it takes more than 10 seconds, then Trio raises a special exception called canceled that just sort of, you know, unwinds out of there. And then that with block catches the exception. So, you know, it's it's a way of saying, okay, whatever's happening that with block, stop doing that and then carry on at that point. Uh, The other nice thing that's important about this um, as compared to a lot of other systems for doing working with timeouts and this cancellation is that we have the with block delimits. Like you can say, this is the operation that I want to cancel, which is really important. So like a sync IO doesn't, work like this. So when I sync IO, you can say, I want to cancel something, and that injects the special exception. But then there's nothing that keeps track of, you can't look at the exception and figure out, okay, did I want to cancel this specific network operation, or this HTTP request, or this like entire program, like, kind of, you don't keep track of that. When Trio, because we, we say this with block, we can say, okay, I know this is the actual said this is the operation that I'm trying to cancel right now. And these can be nested. Yeah, it's awesome. And you, if you want to do like a timeout, you can create a with block that says basically do this to success or fail after 10 seconds. What, what is the syntax for that? It's like async with, I forget. This one is just a regular with. Okay. Cause it, so async with is just like a regular with, except that a regular with does calls a method at the beginning and the end of the block. And async with does an await call of a method at the beginning of the block. And we talk about await being the special th- you know, thing we right. call these special functions. Yeah. And so for it happens that for tri- for timeouts, for, you know, for nurseries, you have to use an async with because at the end of the block, it might ha- the parent might have to wait for the children. Um, and you want to let them run while it's waiting. Right. So it has to be an await there. So it's use async with. For a timeout, you're just you know setting something at the beginning and the end, but there's it doesn't, never, doesn't have to actually like stop and wait for let other things run there it can be synchronous. That's just a little detail. But yeah, so it's it's basically so with block. What we the main one so this basic one is called move on after to kind of remind you that it's gonna run the code and then then if the timeout happened, it doesn't raise an exception. Like it you can stop and see, okay, did it was it canceled or not? But like it keeps executing after the block. So you can like look at it. Which is this again has to do with like like the simplest case for a timeout is just like, okay, if the timeout expires, blow up everything. <laughs> give up exactly there's an exception right but a lot of times you want to say oh well did this thing get canceled if so do some fallback do something else so the core thing in trio is is not to raise an exception after that it's like to provide some object you can look at to see what happened and then figure out how you want to deal with it yeah Um, the other thing that i thought you did well with these cancellation scopes is if there's an exception on one of the tasks and there's a bunch running in one of these with blocks you can 
catch that and use that to cancel the other ones and just say, no, no, things are going wrong. We're, we're out of here. Every, yeah. All the threads are done. We're out of here. Yeah. So, yeah. So the nurseries actually kind of need the cancel scopes because what ha- one of the things the nurseries do is this exception handling thing, right? So if an exception happens in a child, it isn't caught, then it has to hop into the parent. So we have this kind of, I guess the way I think about it is normally you think of like your call stack is like this little chain of like, you know, A calls B calls C calls D, right? What nurseries do is they kind of make it that into like a tree. So like A calls B, B calls C and D and E sort of simultaneously. And then maybe D calls several things at the same time, like, right? So you have this kind of like this tree structure of your, for your call stack. And now some exception happens down inside one of those branches. Well, what do you do with exceptions? You unwind the stack, right? You go, you run any handlers inside that function, and then you go up to the parent, you kill that function's call, and you move into the parent, run any handlers there, and so on. But then we have this problem. If you're going up, unwinding the stack, and you hit one of these places where branch, the stack now branches, how do you sort of unwind past that point, right? You don't want to, like, orphan the other children like, and just unwind the parent without stopping them, because that's <laughs> our whole thing in Trio, right? We say we're not going to let orphans run around <laughs> unsupervised. That's, that's a bad idea. <laughs> Dijkstra doesn't like that. So what we do is, but we have to unwind the stack, right? So what we do is we use the cancellation at that point to go and we cancel all the other tasks that are inside that same nursery. So we we sort of prune the tree, unwind those tasks back up to this point, and then we can keep unwinding from there with the original exception. Yeah, that's that's really clever. I really like the the way you put it all together. So there's also some other uh, pieces, like some file uh, system bits. I love the the whole trick of saying like uh, a wait sleep for a little bit of time, just go, I'm, I'm basically yielding this thread to let it do other work, mm-hmm. but then just carry on as opposed to say like a time dot sleep and things like that. So maybe tell us about the higher order of building blocks. Yeah. So I guess, yeah, so far we've sort of been talking about kind of the core ideas in Trio, which are, you know, not specific to Trio the project. In fact, there's, a, I've had a, talking to a number of other uh, language designers or other languages like, Oh, this is interesting. We're also struggling with these problems. But then, yeah, but Trio is also a specific a project you can download. It has documentation and API and all that. And one of the things I've tried to do with that project is to make it sort of really sort of usable and accessible, kind of have this philosophy of like the you know, kind of the buck stops here for developer experience. Like if there's something that you're trying to, you're trying to write a program using Trio and there's something awkward or difficult or a problem you have, then it's, our, it's up to, on us to solve that. And even maybe it's, it's so we, it's, we have the project itself we also have things like that, like you know, has the core like networking and concurrency stuff. But we also have uh, testing helpers, and we have a documentation, like a plugins for Sphinx to make it easier to document these things. And, nice. So uh, there's something called PyTest-Trio. How's that right. work? With that. So the main thing that PyTest-Trio gives you is that you can have you, when you write a test, you can say, okay, I guess we, should, we need to give a little more information here. So Trio. Basically, there's sort of a stereotype pattern that all Trio programs fall, where you have like an async def main or whatever you want to call it. That's like your top level async function. That's like, that's where you go into that Trio's magic async mode and can use all the Trio stuff. Right. So maybe you start by saying Trio.run main. Yeah. Yeah. So the thing about async functions is you can only call them from other async functions. So you have this problem of how do you call your first ASIC function? And that's what trio.run is. So you have this little bit of ceremony at the very top of every Trio program. And this is also the case for like async IO and so on. But like you say, you have to like switch into Trio mode. And that's kind of annoying in a test suite to do that on every single test. So that's the most basic thing that PyTest Trio does for you is it lets it see, makes it so you can write async def, test, whatever. And it will take care of like setting up Trio and turning it on there. Uh, mm-hmm. But it also has some other handy stuff. So one thing is that it allows you to have async fixtures, and it does some sort of magic to like goes switches into trio mode and then sets up your fixtures and then calls your test and then tears down the fixtures. So it's sort of all within this async context. And it's also integrated with some of the testing helpers that are built into trio itself. So in particular, the one that's sort of the most you know gee whiz awesome is that trio has this ability to use a fake clock. So this is an issue when you're writing like networking programs, like often you want to like have a test about, okay, what does happen if this HTTP request just hangs forever? Like do my timeouts work correctly? Stuff like that, right? But it's right. really annoying to, write, to run these tests because it's like, okay, and now I have to sit and wait for a minute for the timeout to fire and make sure something happens. 
And that happens every time you run your test. It just spends a minute sitting there doing nothing. And you're like, I'm really you're like, okay, but <laughs> like, this is really boring. I want my test suite to finish already. And I need like a hundred of these tests. And but, yeah. <laughs> so, killing my build time. Exactly. Yeah. Right. It's like really ruins your flow. So one thing I've, I've done, actually, what I did is when writing Trio itself, I said, okay, I really want Trio's own test suite to run really quickly. I fear that'll force me to like come up with the tools that my users will need to make their test suites run quickly. Yeah. So I put, I would, if you just type PyTest Trio, you, you know, if you want to contribute to Trio, we'd love to have you. We're very friendly and all that. If you type PyTest Trio, it runs in like five seconds. It has like 99 point something percent test coverage, which is like, completely it's very difficult to get there because trio is this really complicated sort of networking library it's all this stuff that's usually hard to test part of that is that for all the time of tests we have this magic clock and so what the way it works is you say okay trio i don't want you to use i know it says like sleep 30 seconds or whatever i don't want you to actually you sleep three, 30 real seconds i only want you i want you to sleep 30 virtual seconds and so it's a special thing you sort of pass to trio.run to say Every time you have timeouts, sleeping, anything inside this call, I want you to sort of use this virtual clock instead. And the way the virtual clock works, it starts out at time zero, and it just stays there. And you can like advance it manually if you want or things like that. But normally what you do is you just let, use the automatic behavior, which is it's just, it's, it stays at time zero, and then it wa sort of watches what your program is doing. And any time that your program sort of like finishes running everything and just stops and is waiting for stuff to happen, then it looks to see, okay, uh, looks like the next thing that would wake up, there's like a sleep 10 and a sleep 20. Okay, so in 10 seconds, that's the next one that'll wake up. I'm just going to jump the clock forward 10 seconds and then start I running see. again, right? So anytime it knows it's going to be waiting for a certain amount, it's like, all right, we'll just we'll yeah. let the wait start and then we'll just go right past that. So it's basically, yeah, you just write your test the way you normally would with like for use timeouts regularly, test your real code, put sleeps, whatever is easiest. And then... What's annoying about that normally is then you know, your test takes like 30 seconds, a minute, whatever it is to run, most of which the time is just sitting there doing nothing, waiting for time to pass. So if you flip the switch to use the special clock, then it does this exactly the same things, but it just skips over all those times when it's sitting doing nothing. And so suddenly nice. your test runs in like a few milliseconds. Oh, that's um, awesome. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. And then yeah. PyTest Trio is hooked up to that. So you can just turn this on with just like flip the switch on any test. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So one of the things that makes me a little bit sad about Python's async loops and stuff is like the async IO based apps and the trio based apps, those are not exactly the same and they're not exactly compatible. Yeah, right. It's not like the, the core, you're using the same core and so it just keeps running. Like the async IO loop and the trio loop, these are not the same. They got to be like brought together with different APIs, right? Yeah, but you um, you seem to you do have some interoperability, so like Trio can work with libraries that maybe assume async IO is there or something, right? Trio itself is just like a totally different library than async IO. I looked at you know could I build it on top of async IO, um, and there's sort of a number of reasons why that didn't sort of make sense. And yes, and there is this big problem because it's just because of technical things about how these async concurrency systems work. There has to be like one library ultimately that controls all the actual networking, like async AO or Trio or whatever, or Twisted or Tornado or something. And that means to so like if you have a like a, say an HTTP client that's written to work on async AO, it won't necessarily work on Trio because it's using a different set of networking primitives underneath, or right. vice versa. And this is sort of a a larger sort of ecosystem problem, right? So. There used to be there was Twisted and Tornado and G Event and they all none of them could interoperate. You'd have to like pick which one you're using. And AsyncIO was sort of one of the reasons it exists is to try and solve that problem and become the standard one that then Twisted and Tornado and everyone can use. And now they can all work on top of AsyncIO. And now all those libraries written for Twisted and Tornado, you can mix and match however you like. And then here comes Trio and kind of ruins that <laughs> by being here is this new thing you should use. So to try and kind of mitigate that, there is this library called uh, Trio AsyncIO, which lets you use AsyncIO libraries on top of Trio. The way it does this is it kind of, it creates like a virtual AsyncIO loop that internally uses Trio's primitives under the cover. And it kind of lets you, you know, kind of cordon them off in kind of a little container, sort of I all see. the weird stuff AsyncIO can do. You can do that stuff, but um, kind of in a little box <laughs> that won't like leak out to pollute the rest of your program, your Trio program. So 
I, I think this is really encouraging because yeah. that means if you maybe have already invested in ACIO and you've already got some code written on it, like you could still yeah, run Trio exactly. without going, I'm rewriting yeah. it in Trio and is that worth it? Is that a good idea? Yeah, or it, yeah, and it gives you sort of an incremental path. You can exactly. say like, well, okay, I, I can at least get it running on Trio, first of all, and then I can start porting one piece at a time and eventually end up all in Trio, hopefully. Exactly. Now, the reason it's not, you can't just magically make this all work because Trio and Asyncio really have fundamentally different ideas about how things should work. Now, obviously, I think Trio's ideas are better. <laughs> They're kind of the new thing that I try to fix all these problems. But it's not that it's, the differences aren't just like in terms of the internal implementation. The differences are in terms of just like the fundamental concepts that are exposed right, to Like the people. philosophy of it all. Yeah, and, right. It totally yeah. changes how you write the library on top. So, right. so it's not something you can just sort of magically switch. But it, there's yeah. a little bit of an incremental aspect to it. I, so we're almost out of time. Just right. really quickly, what's the future of Trio? Like, where is it going? What do you got planned? And uh, is it production ready? So yeah, so I should be clear. Yeah, right now, the Trio library itself is very solid, but there is not much of an ecosystem around it. So like, there is not currently an HTTP client or an HTTP server that you can just use out of the box and it's like mature and all that. For Trio. There are some solutions for these kinds of issues. And I don't want to say too much because you know, this will change quickly. We have a chat channel. Um, if you go to our uh, documentation or whatever, you can like, find out what the latest news is about what you should use. But it's not something that you know, is ready today to run big websites or something like that. Okay. It's because the libraries aren't there yet. If you'd like to help, you know, write those libraries and make it happen, I'd love to have you. We have a really uh, solid contributing policy and things like that. You can check it out. The other thing that's happening is async.io. So I also, I spend a lot of time, um, I am a core Python developer. I talked to Yuri Selvanov as the main async.io developer and Guido about all this stuff. And so there is this, Yuri is quite keen on saying, oh, wow, well, well, right, you know, Trio's ideas are better. We should add them all into async.io. This is quite... There's a lot of, I mean, we could probably do a whole other podcast <laughs> about all the trade-offs there. And maybe we should. I don't know. It's pretty interesting. It is interesting. Yeah. Relevant. So that's something that's also happening is that Yuri is going to be trying to add nurseries and cancel scopes and things to Async.io. So I think there's a lot, going to be a lot of limitations since a lot of the value in Trio is the things people can't do. And Async.io has already got like six layers of abstraction built in there. Or, I don't know. It's not actually six, but it's like four but, yeah, or something. Yeah. Yeah. And they're all totally doing all the things that Trio says. These are, these are things that should never be done. It shouldn't be possible. So you can't, that's not something you could fix by just adding a new layer on top. But, you know, yeah. it's still better than nothing, right? Like, you know, async.io right. would continue to exist. So we do want to make it as good as possible. these ideas. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And ultimately, we don't, I mean, maybe, like, no one knows for sure whether, like, the make a new thing plus a compatibility layer like Trio, the Trio yeah. asyncio thing I mentioned. Is that going to be the best thing? Or is making asyncio better going to be the best thing? We, none of us know for sure. So we, we are trying both versions. Um, and we'll That's sort cool. of see that. I'm but, super excited just to hear that that collaboration is happening. I think that's great. All right. Uh, I think we're out of time for Trio. It's a yeah. super interesting project, and I really love what you've done there. I think it's, I think it's brilliant. So uh, people should definitely check right. it out. Thanks a lot. Yeah, you're welcome. So quick two final questions. If you want to write uh -huh. some Python code, what editor do you use? I use Emacs. I've been using it for 20 years. I'm stuck. <laughs> awesome. It's, it's now, great. But it's not any, I don't know that it works for other people or not just because, yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure. I definitely, I started on Emacs as well. And notable PyPI back? Yeah, well, Trio, obviously. <laughs> obviously. And uh, PyTest S Trio? Yeah, um, PyTest Trio, uh, Sphinx Control Trio. There's, if you go to the, you know, github.com slash Python dash Trio to see all the different projects under the Trio organization, and they're sort of trying to build up that ecosystem, like I said. So, yeah, it sounds cool. Yeah, so final call to action. People are excited. They want to try Trio. Maybe they want to contribute to it. What do they do? Yeah, so check out, start with the documentation, trio.readthedocs.io. That also will give you links to our chat is um, sort of a place to hang out. Uh, it has our contributing docs if you want to get involved like that. Uh, we give out commitments on your first pull request acceptance. So there's lots of awesome. people. Yeah, we, we want, you know, this is a project for everyone. I, want, I don't want to just be my, you know, personal little thing. Uh, yeah, that sounds great. Awesome. Yeah. All right, Nathaniel, thank you for sharing your project and creating it. It's, it's quite great. And uh, we may yeah. have to come back and dig into this a little bit more. This is fun. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Yeah. Talk to you later. You too. Bye-bye. This has been another episode of Talk Python to Me. Our guest on this episode was Nathaniel Smith, and it was brought to you by Linode and Rollbar. Linode is bulletproof hosting for whatever you're building with Python. 
Get four months free at talkpython.fm slash Linode. That's L-I-N-O-D-E. Rollbar takes the pain out of errors. They give you the context and insight you need to quickly locate and fix errors that might have gone unnoticed until your users complain, of course. As Talk Python to Me listeners, track a ridiculous number of errors for free at rollbar.com slash talkpython to me. Want to level up your Python? If you're just getting started, try my Python Jumpstart by building 10 apps or our brand new 100 Days of Code in Python. And if you're interested in more than one course, be sure to check out the Everything Bundle. It's like a subscription that never expires. Be sure to subscribe to the show. Open your favorite podcatcher and search for Python. We should be right at the top. You can also find the iTunes feed at slash iTunes, Google Play feed at slash play, and direct RSS feed at slash RSS on talkpython.fm. This is your host, Michael Kennedy. Thanks so much for listening. I really appreciate it. Now get out there and write some Python code.